ABC Stone has been a season of events sponsor for TCLF for the past seven years. When I think about my job, I think about working with TCLF, working with Charles and the board, and some of the amazing spaces we've gotten to see and be part of, part of bringing Courageous by Design to New York after the pandemic that was supposed to happen before the pandemic and then it ended up, ended up happening after. We've been able to arrange some amazing quarry tours and um, just be part of some programming that this world needs. I've heard people talk about what happens when you know Charles and when your phone rings and you see Charles Birnbaum on your phone. And no matter what you are doing, you pick up that call. You just do. It was early 2019 when Charles called me and said, hey kiddo, in that way that he says, it makes me feel very flattered. And he said, I have a little bit of a situation and I'm hoping you can help me. And I said, yes, what is it? And he said, uh, we have this Kylie exhibition and you know it's got a place to go in April of 2020, but it doesn't really have any place to go right now. We just took it down and we'd really like a place to store it do you have a spot? Well, what was I gonna say? So I said, of course we do. And little did anybody know that April of 2020, as we knew it, would never come. So we have been housing this Kylie exhibition for the past five years, <laughs> which felt like a shame because it felt like it needed to be out in the world and it needed to be seen. and. In the past five years, ABC has grown and expanded, and one of the things that we've been able to do is open a dedicated education and exhibition space just across the street. Now, I would love to say I did that, and we all came together and we built this space just for this ex exhibition, and we didn't, that would be false, but we did do it knowing that we could really follow our, one of our core values, which is education, and we could really give back to this community in all the ways that it's given to us. When the opportunity arose for us to show this exhibition, and in its expanded form, in a way that it's never been seen before, it was just this past September when I was with Charles, and I sat him down and I said, I want to show Kylie. And he was like, okay, where? And I was like, in Brooklyn, in January. <laughs> And so anyway, here we are, and we're thrilled to be here, and we're thrilled that you're all here, and more than anything, we're thrilled that Charles and Raymond have come to teach us about Kylie and about the Ford Foundation rehabilitation and all of the wonder therein. This is not going to be a Dan Kylie lecture tonight. This is going to be a taste of Kylie. When Lindsay asked me about um, putting this show up in January, and I never thought we'd have over 200 people here, my first response was, We've got to get Raymond Jungles. I have been, I feel like an ambassador for the work that Raymond has done at the Ford Foundation. Um, I had the privilege of being invited to come in by the foundation with Gensler to peer review the work. And when we mounted this exhibition, it, was one, it came up one year after the centennial of Kylie's birth. And the reason for that was previously, Mies van der Rohe had three exhibitions for his centennial of his birth here in New York City. And for Dan Kiley, nothing happened. And so at the foundation, all of the work that we do is about raising the visibility, instilling value, and engaging the public with a better understanding of what it is that landscape architecture is and what it is that landscape architects do. The title tonight for tonight's lecture is called treading lightly. And I chose this for two reasons. The first is Cornelia Han Obelander, who was the namesake of the Obelander Prize, who interned at Dan Kiley's office at the onset of her career and was woken in the morning by the goat that needed milking. And she slept in the same bed as Keiki Kiley. And you can ask, I know there's at least one, maybe two brothers here this evening. Yep, three. Okay, can I ask you guys to raise your hands, please? Wow. So. Oh my gosh, this is fantastic. The Kylie kids are in the house. Thank you for coming tonight. And Cornelia told me a story once that Dan had come in from snowshoeing or cross country skiing. And she said as Cornelia would lean into me, so I'd have to lean down to her. And she said, Charles, you must tread lightly.
That is what Dan said. And so I, to really think about that in the context of the Ford Foundation is exactly what's happened here. And what we're going to see tonight from Raymond is he's going to make visible the analysis and thought process behind that work. But to me, there is such a reverence to Kylie's design intent through all the myriad challenges that don't make it easy when you're dealing with an indoor atrium space where the original landscape architect in New York City specified magnolias. So what I want to do is just give a sort of a little taste of Dan. And my generation, this is the Kylie that we knew at this point, this kind of insane hair. Um, and, you know, but we also saw this kind of exuberance that was infectious. It was otherworldly. One of the things I talk about is publish or perish. Um, until the collaboration with Jane Amidon, Dan really didn't write. Before the exhibition of the Miller Garden was mounted by Peter Walker with Alan Ward's photographs, the Miller Garden had been invisible for the first near quarter century of its life. So again, the goal here is to make the legacy visible. And I wanted to just also sort of set the stage to get a sense of what it was like in the early years, life in Vermont, life in the military, and what's been written about Dan. For example, he was the architect on the courtroom for the Nuremberg trials, so he wasn't just practicing landscape architecture. And just to give you a little sense of life in Vermont, um, <clears throat> we know that skiing was a, a big part I do think we should be selling, Lindsay, these little hats that make you look like a pumpkin here at the exhibition if we're gonna be here in the winter months. But you know, think about where we all work. Think about the idea of Cheryl Barton telling stories of having to row out onto the water in a boat to pick up who's landed on the water to bring back into the office. Uh, this was not an easy place to get to, and yet they all came to him. So. I don't know, I just, I wanted to kind of capture this playfulness, and this is not something we've shown publicly before, um, and it really does give a sense of um, what life was like there. And, you know, there's a lot of snow. <laughs> uh, it, was, it was prevalent. Someone really had to want to be there and had to want to get there. But, you know, to me, when I see these photographs of Dan, it's just such a contrast to what my generation was exposed to when we saw these images of him or we saw him give a lecture somewhere. And there were nine kids. I mean, there are stories that we've heard of the kids running around naked. Dan would come back from a trip and throw toys in the air. Maybe there were six, and so six got lucky. The other three cried. I love the image of him driving this uh, and probably going golfing. But this gives you a sense, and also what we want to do with the exhibition, if you go to our website as well, we do want to lift the veil on those that were also working in the office. These three all went to the University of Pennsylvania. If you know the late Tony Walmsley who practiced here, he was a classmate of theirs. Uh, Joe Carr is on the left, and we have Ian Tyndall and Peter Kerr Walker later in life. Uh, this is sort of the period I got to visit Dan and Ann uh, towards the, the last years of their lives in Vermont. But I also wanted to take a moment and sort of at least hit the impact of La Notre and the French landscape. Uh, this is actually Dan um, going to sew. Uh, this, of course, is the Art Institute and a wonderful um, little known interview that Greg Bleem did with Dan Kiley late in life. Uh, Greg Bleem and Peter Schout both graduated at the same time and worked in the office. He notes the, difference, the different dimensions in what they do and how they affect when you pick trees and place them. So many feet on center, Kylie said, this is very important, whether they're 10 feet, 12 feet, 15 feet, or 18 feet on center. Just like the windows in the Palazzo Farnese, those things are what make it wonderful or not, the spatial proportion. I also wanted to contrast the view from Valandry, a landscape that we know that Kylie visited, and the Miller Garden. This is not the Potager, it's a space that is less photographed. And when I went to Villandry and had seen this, I was gobsmacked at the similarities to the Miller Garden. And then finally, Shanti and the Chicago filtration plant at Milton Lee Olive Park. Uh, these are all among the 28 sites that are in the exhibition across the street. And so just to not be too serious, a couple of quotes by Dan. I never promised you a rock garden. <laughs> or when I see stress coming, I lie down flat until it passes. So uh, uh, thank you, Dan, for that. 
What I want to do with the rest of my time is very quickly just touch on a few ideas. First is we have to designate these places. And tied to the designation is the writing. Publish or perish, we have to create a historic context, we have to make these places visible, and what should project work in terms of best practices for landscape architects when they're managing change. So the first is nominations. And what's remarkable to me, there are over a thousand buildings listed on the National Register that are less than 50 years old. There's a scant number of works of landscape architecture. So, so for example, the Jefferson Expansion Arch has been designated several times over for the object. Here's the National Register nomination. You'll notice that when this was designated the first time, landscape architecture box is not checked. When the Historic American Building Survey documented the site, you'll notice that Dan Kiley is not recognized, but the photographer Jack Boucher is. When it was revisited to the nomination and to the register in 1987, you'll see the areas of significance are architecture, community planning, and engineering. Landscape architecture is still not present. The same year the exhibition initially opened, Dale Yeager completed Historic American Landscape Survey documentation. And so it wasn't until 2014 that the Park Service as stewards recognized that the Gateway Arch was a significant work of landscape architecture. None of these places, we now have a current project moving forward for the Dallas Museum of Art. Four blocks away, pivotal work of postmodernism not designated at Fountain Place. The Great Landscape in Chicago at the Art Institute, Milton Lee Olive Park. Here in New York City, the only largely intact Dan Kiley landscape is not designated at Rockefeller University. And yet, there are examples out there. Since modernism has had its sort of renaissance through groups like Docomomo and others, and not to mention the amount of books that have been published, first beginning with the Philip Johnson Glass House in 1999, the, the multiple property nomination in Columbus, Indiana, including the Miller Garden, the Gropius House in Lincoln, Mass., and Russell Wright's Manitoga in Garrison, New York. All of these places are designated for both architecture and landscape architecture. There is a profound understanding of the relationship, sometimes the seamless relationship, between inside and outside. And then the Air Force Academy, which was designated in 2005. But that's it. Oh, and I should mention in the UK that in 2020, the work of Cummings there uh, was listed as grade two on the British equivalent of the National Register and designated as a level two heritage site. So some of these places have been designated, but we have to expand our knowledge to advance others. And this is why I talk about publish or perish. When the Miller Garden was designated in 2000, almost every single endnote was Gary Hildebrand's 88-page monograph about the Miller Garden. So by having that available to architectural historians, to traditional state preservation offices, the work then was listed. We've done much of this at the foundation through our own publications. We have over 1,400 pioneer profiles, including many people that were in Kylie's office that are not household names like Ian Tyndall, Peter Kerr Walker, and Joe Carr shown here. We've created digital guides. We have over 2,700 landscapes and more than three dozen Kylie landscapes in our GPS-enabled database. So this is a context-making machine. Projects now begin to document these landscapes when they're threatened with change, as was done by the Park Service at Independence Mall and Dan Kylie's commission there from 59 to 61. And then the oral history, some of which we'll see across the street, the late Harriet Pattison, who passed away last year. Here are some wonderful sketches of um, the staff done by the kids. This is Ian Tyndall with his kid and Harriet with her son Nathaniel Kahn, of course best known for the movie My Architect. And here are the two of them. I wanted to show this from Joe Carr just because I know that Raymond's gonna be showing some of the images that it took to rehabilitate the Ford Foundation. Uh, this was it the first time around. And this is also in our oral history. And here is Joe with Raymond when he flew to Michigan to meet with him to understand, and not to mention the riches that uh, Joe has in, as a sort of an archivist himself uh, in terms of understanding Kylie's design intent. Elevate the visibility. How many people here saw the movie Columbus a few years ago? I mean, every time we saw a building, the architect was mentioned, whether it was a historic figure or a contemporary figure, never once. I mean, look at all of the posters for this. It's all happening in Kylieville. 
it's all there, and yet the landscape architect's name was never said once out loud in that whole film. So it's up to us, and this is what we do through the work of the Cultural Landscape Foundation to make these places visible. We do this through our What's Out There weekends. Here, for example, is the late Peter Shouten, Joe Carr at the Art Institute for that weekend. We created kids' guides in partnership with the National Register of Historic Places. Um, here are weekend events at the National Gallery, which has been restored and rehabilitated in Washington and the Oakland Museum, which was the subject of a recent rehabilitation by uh, Walter Hood. Ian Tyndall came back to lead a garden dialogue for us at a Marcel Breuer, Dan Kiley collaboration in Maryland. Here are many of the former Kiley employees that were part of our Man It's a Modernism tour. Here was modernism um, at the Air Force Academy and then different conferences built around these figures to make their contributions to the legacy visible. This was a recent lecture by Peter Kerr Walker from Kylie Walker at that time on the Dallas work. And then, as we'll see here tonight, traveling exhibitions. I wanted to show Marvels of Modernism, which was our first to look at this topic in 2008, because you'll see there were four photographs of the Miller Garden. And at that time, the Miller Garden was facing an uncertain future. This is before the Indianapolis Museum of Art stepped up and was willing to take on that stewardship objective. We also partnered with ASLA chapters and Design Within Reach to do a sort of a signboard show that traveled around the country, other openings, and then again on our website, you can dig into these sites and understand what the current state is. For example, just to go back for one second, North Christian Church had a congregation of only 50, and right now it's going through an RFP process to understand what its future life is going to be. This has also changed, as you'll see in a moment. Here's the Miller Garden and Millis and Harvey's great photographs. Probably the only time I've ever seen this image from the interior, looking at the fenestration in conversation with the LA. And then finally, project work. What do you as practicing landscape architects think about as your own stewardship ethic when you're approaching these places? In Burlington right now, there's litigation going on. This is probably one of the only uh, intact Dan Kiley commissions in his home state where he worked his entire productive life. This is a lawsuit right now that's going on for the Barnes Church. The DMA, when they initially issued the RFP for this competition, it talked about, quote, available open space. This is the winning competition drawing, and if you look closely, you cannot really see the Kiley Gardens here. What's going to happen to those? This is a seminal work of modernism um, that's facing an uncertain future. At the Miller Garden, there's been recent restoration efforts. You'll see here, for example, where there was English ivy, which has been replaced with liriope. This is a masterpiece. Every plant matters, color, scale, form, texture. That's different today. Here at the, uh, what was the Irwin Bank, which is also a National Historic Landmark, on the left-hand side from my trip about a year and a half ago, new plantings, this is what it looked like historically. So we're chipping away at these places. The outdoor parking bays or parking rooms that Kylie created at North Christian, we could see these sad little cupcakes that have uh, been planted here. Here in this particular case, it's about the vegetative mass, maybe not the plant, but should we have to wait 10 years to achieve Kylie's design intent or would a substitute material have achieved that? At Fountain Place, there's been a whole new revitalization project. There's been some new construction. The advertising campaign is engage in art, live in art. This is the original plan. Focus on the building at the top, the way it steps. It had never been realized. Now it's a new parking structure by a carpenter. It's a wonderful building, but you can see that it has an impact. And so part of the landscape has become a sacrificial lamb. And you see that on the left and in the middle, where water's been replaced with lawn, and this particular tree that has been replanted is in the eve of that new building. So on one hand, we have the core of this being restored, and we have a trade-off here. How do you measure success? And, the, and finally, two projects that I'll end with, really actually one, Michael Van Valkenburg and Associates, the work at the St. Louis Arch. This to me is the gold standard for looking at how to manage change in a public urban park. Uh, this is a park that was built during the urban renewal era. It did not connect with its context, and it had a program for a new visitor center that was 47,000 square feet. So what was done here is the building, as you could see, is subterranean largely. The entrance and alignments of all the circulation is as it was historically, and the regrading operations when you're in the park is you do not see the structure. 
Additionally, regrading happened throughout the park so that when you got to the far end, we now have porous edges and, and access that you can move through the park and move through the community much more seamlessly. So to me, this is a great example of rehabilitation while honoring the Kylie's design intent. And this is my last image, uh, the Ford Foundation. Um, and I'm just delighted now to pass the microphone over to uh, Raymond and have him tell us about the work there. Thank you for joining us this evening. Thanks. Thank you, Charles. Time lapse of the project that just went, went finished in 2019. It was, um, it was a renovation of a building that had to be brought up to code. There was a lot of uh, asbestos in the building. The hardscape was all landmarked, but the planting wasn't. One of the main things working with Gensler and the Ford Foundation was to increase the accessibility. So there were minor changes to the hardscape that allowed for a lift to get up to the third level of the garden, which wasn't available before. And so more than double the access for someone who needed to be able to get around and wasn't able to. They also removed one planter that Dan had on 42nd Street and, on, and did a new door so you could actually go in the building on 42nd Street now and get into the elevator and go up to uh, 43rd Street, which you could never do before. You'd have to enter on 43rd Street. Today would have been my mother's birthday, so that's why I agreed to do this. No, not really, but God bless her. And I was born with the last name Jungles. <laughs> you saw this before, two great men. I didn't get to meet Dan, although I was here in New York and must have been 1981 or 82, and I saw in the newspaper that he was here and he was going to give a talk at Columbia with the architect Wolf, and I was able to get in there, and it was wonderful. He waltzes in there and he says, what's all this talk about design? He says, you know, architecture. Interior design, landscape architecture, he says, it's all design. And that's what, what he said, and he was a maverick and he meant it. So <clears throat> I'd been to the Ford Foundation many times, and uh, I'd never seen the Dan Kiley design. I saw the hardscape, it was there, but all the plants had long gone. And I know that the magnolias, which were brought right from the nursery without any acclimation and put inside, some of them lasted for 18 years, but they all got very phototropic. The, the grow lights hadn't been working and a lot of things like that. But when I started doing the research, I was actually amazed that there wasn't a lot more available about it. But I found this, uh, and Ford Foundation does have some pretty good ar archives. I found that image on the left, and I said, wow. He created a forest inside a building that's adjacent to a forest outside the building. And of course, the building by Roche was like incredible uh, with the ability of all these light to get light in here, but not really enough light to do what Dan had hoped. Dan said right from the start that it was an experiment, that no one had done anything like it. You know, he had plans for photo, for uh, bloom sequencing. He used a lot of temperate plants, which really don't do well in interior environments. And so a lot of things failed over, the, over time. But one of the reasons why my firm doesn't do much interior work, in fact, this is the only interior job we've ever done, is that um, plants don't live forever when you put them in a building. You know, they have to be managed. But this is a project that's important enough to manage the landscape because it brings nature into the city, much the way we try to do on our projects, but into a great city. On the right is the image that was taken shortly after we did the, the re rehabilitation. So I think from more or less the same angle that we're able to bring his vision back. <clears throat> Working closely, uh, Darren actually selected us. I had done some work with their COO, John Bernstein, before. We did the Leon Levy Native Plant Preserve in Eleuthera, uh, working with Shelby White and the Leon Levy uh, Foundation. And everything that we put together here was, this is one of Darren's favorite images, was about you know, social justice, inclusivity. You know, it was for the first time they were gonna modernize the building to where they'd have a more open floor plan. 
before there was like Mad Men kind of design, you know, this, the chief executive's office and everybody else in cubicles. There was no flow. There was no uh, justice, social justice within the building. So um, there's actually new tenants in there now that have uh, like-minded um, functions. And there, there are new activities in the building for the public to be able to come in and, and, and experience this great building and garden. Some of the things that uh, Darren, Darren was so interested in this project. We actually had a great group of people, I have the slide up here, who, who were par participated from the very beginning, from, uh, from the research, through the schematic design, through design development, and finally the contract documents. We worked under Gensler. We were basically hired by Darren Walker. We brought in SiteWorks from the very beginning because we're in Miami, Florida. We needed presence here and someone with a great reputation, and they did an amazing job. FMS did the lighting, brought back you know, modern uh, grow lights that work really well. James Urban, a great collaborator on many other projects, helped us with the soils and some of the things that we weren't familiar with up here. And then, because I got to meet the people at the New York Botanical Gardens when we did the 2009 orchid show, I met uh, Frances Cuello, Fran, and she agreed to be my horticultural consultant here. So we'd go there and we'd see what was doing really well under low light, and she worked with us throughout, and then actually does some consulting with them still. And SiteWorks is still involved in the maintenance and the, uh, the, the, the continuing of the legacy. Alpine did an amazing job doing the installation. And Hennigan, of course, did the construction. They did an amazing job. What a difficult project. And at the beginning, it's like, I'm a designer. I'm not a historic preservationist. I needed to figure out what the heck I was supposed to do. So we did this whole thing about what is it? And then, you know, it's, re it's, it's rehabilitation. Yeah, I had fantasies of, of doing cascading water and you know, things like that. But, it wasn't appropriate and would never have passed the Landmarks Commission. So I was quickly told, Raymond, that's not really what you're supposed to do. But it was all about pushing the envelope to see what could be done. When did Dan do this? 1964. He'd been practicing for basically 20 years. Um, Joe Carr was 25 then, and he was the project manager for this, and he was also the project manager for Oakland. When studying the plant materials, a lot of these plants came from California nurseries because where are the great nurseries in this country? I mean, I would dare say the best are in Florida, but um, California has a lot of good ones. And he was using a lot of the same species from his project in California inside. He was using eucalyptus trees that had this beautiful red bark. You know, there were eight big magnolias. That was a hierarchical tree. It had a more tropical texture and was put in the more prominent places. And uh, so it was the scariest job I've ever done. Had to understand Dan's intent, which, by the way, I've never seen anything like that from Dan. I've seen really strict kind of classical design with rows of trees, LAs, and things like that. And I was looking at this, and where is the organization? The time schedule. This all had to be done in the time of the building restoration, and the work for the landscape had to be done in the last 30 days. Regulations, well, it was landmarked. Uh, we could only bring one tree across the bridge at a time, so that semis were like uh, lined up over in New Jersey. It's also part of the logistics. We knew that the trees had to be acclimated, and I'll get into that a little bit more. The environment, initially, they were gonna have a separate HVAC system for atrium because plants like more moisture and humidity than humans do. But now it's the same exact HVA system inside the atrium and in the offices. And then on top of it all, oh, and the other thing is procurement. We had to get the trees selected and started to be prepared before we even selected the landscape contractor. So we had to go to the nurseries, find the trees. This was after the, the selection process of what species we'd be using. and. Um, we had to bring them to the shade house that had to be built to acclimate everything. We did the, new, the Missouri gravel method, so we took all the soil off the roots. We'd never done anything like that before. It's like, uh, okay, 
James Irvin, you say that's what we should do, we'll do it. You know better than I. So we took all the soil off, brought the trees to the shade house, and right when they were about to build the shade house, Hurricane Irma came through South Florida. And uh, basically, all the trees were laid down, and they got buffeted around a little bit. But it, had they, the shade house been finished, and the trees been in there, we would have really been screwed, pardon my French. So what was the job like when we first saw it? It looked like this. There was no spatial uh, transparency. It was a collection of mall plants, and it was dense. You couldn't even see the different levels. When one plant would die, the people who were doing the maintenance would bring a new plant from, you know, they'd order extra from whatever job they're doing, plop it in the place. Well, this should live in there. I never saw irrigation in there, and as far as I know, they never had irrigation. The slopes were incredibly steep, and because of the way they were irrigating it, and the fact that when they planted the trees, the first trees, those big magnolias, you saw the root balls that Charles showed you. They're eight, nine feet in diameter. How do you plant that on a slope like this? So there was a lot of erosion built into the design, and so everything slumped. And they started putting these stone walls everywhere to, to hold the grade. And transparency and visual movement through the site was so important. This design was really about movement through the space. And as we got to analyze it more and more, we realized the brilliance of this orthogonal geometry. And you know, you've got this main area that's down lower than the street. You can't see the, the reflecting pool from 42nd Street. You come into the space, and you can see it. And then when you come into the space, then you can see that, well, you couldn't before we rehabilitated the project. You could actually see the different levels of the garden that you can make your way to. So it was the whole thing about gardens were about discovery and movement. So the whole idea about visual connections and having large enough trees to be able to achieve that, no one will ever bring 35-foot trees into the Ford Foundation again. You know, because first time they did it, they didn't put the brick down yet. They were dragging these huge trees you know, with pulley systems up ramps, up with plywood over, over concrete steps. Joe Carr told me the first two trees they brought were girdled by trying to get them into place. That's kind of scary, right? So um, we had the opportunity to, the building was under construction, all the hardscape was in place, but we had to remove a mullion of the building, which we had to get permission because that was touching a landmark structure to be able to uh, create a platform to bring in with a lull, an articulated loader, one tree onto this, we called it the dance floor at a time, and they worked a spider crane into the corner where they had removed the planter, which was the one thing that was a major change from the Kylie design. And so if we hadn't been able to do that, it would have been impossible. But we have documented now what goes where in order to keep the design that Dan Kiley had envisioned. And different trees will not be brought in. It'll be the same species of plants that'll work. They'll just be brought in smaller if one needs to be replaced. So the overall design will stay the same. And we did a lot of research about plants. It's one of the things I love about being a landscape architect. I love plants. I love to research plants. I like doing projects in places where I really shouldn't be doing projects so I could learn more about plants and ecosystems. And then, of course, I bring in experts to help me when I'm out of my league. Circulation. What was the circulation? You have to maintain it also. This, so see, these were some of the drawings that we're doing. This one I found, this is one of the most interesting ones for me, is the view analysis as you move through the space. Look how many different fixed point perspectives you get as you move through that space from different levels. It was incredible. Light coming into the space. You'd think, oh, there's a lot of light. Look at all those windows. But it's fleeting light. Plants need a couple hundred foot candles to really do their thing. You know, and uh, so I actually bought a light meter. And I started going to all the darker places that I knew and the plants that I knew liked it. We actually brought some new species into the garden that were from plants that I know in Florida I use in the darker areas. Then to top it off, they changed the glass on the first few levels to blast glass, which doesn't allow as much light in. So that made it a little bit more difficult. 
So this was the existing grade. You see the dark color. Those were all these stacked stone walls. We didn't want anything like that. These were some of the diagrams we did to show where not only the stacked stone walls, but the slumping grade. I mean, part of the precision of the space is that incredible grade that they've created from just the way the hardscape was laid out. And the slopes mattered. So working with SiteWorks, uh, we worked with this uh, fiber we could build into the top layer of the soil that helped stabilize the grade. And we were very careful on the installation. With the trees grown in the Missouri gravel method, <clears throat> we're able to bring the roots in, kind of shape them to the soil uh, angle, and put the soil around them. So we didn't have these like weird uh, holes where the trees were planted. One of the coolest things I read was Dan Kiley, you know, I mean, I know he must have imagined those eucalyptus growing 80 feet tall, you know. It's a 10-story space. But one of the things that he, but they only lasted a couple months from what I heard. And the, and the pears, I think, died after a couple months from what I read. But he always envisioned or had a fantasy of having it rain in that space. There's no birds in the space. There's no wind in the space other than the HVAC, which <clears throat> killed a couple of our first trees that we brought in because it hadn't been balanced yet and it was blowing really way too much on these trees. So here I am, not knowing if this Missouri gravel method would work, but having faith in uh, James Urban. And, and then the, two of the first big trees died. You know, one of the things we did was we had like five or six replacement trees that we could bring in during the beginning part while the mullion was still gone to be able to make, make up for things like that. Thank God we did that. And so this is, this is really a couple months after it was finished. So we were able to get this amazing, massive green inside a building, and, um, and that was five years ago. Who's been there recently? Tell me it's looking great. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. It's looking better than ever, right? <laughs> this was uh, my, my, my drawing when we finally, at the DD level, uh, figured out all the all the different uh, layers and then photoshopped it all together. What a beautiful design. You know, the hardscape, the planting, the tree placement, the architecture, the location. And the only thing that we really did that we think is a contribution is Dan actually had water lilies and flowering plants in the pond in his initial design, which they wouldn't live there. There's not enough light. So what they ended up doing was someone put a a square planter in the middle of the reflection pond that stuck up about 18 inches from the surface and people were throwing you know coins in there and that was just you know it was just ridiculous for such a sacred space but and you know and there was no sound there was no movement so we thought the least we could do is detail the pond to be very minimal you know the brick material works through the whole thing then we did a recessed uh, gutter that keep the water up very high and it actually makes a beautiful little slight sound when you're in there and keeps it highly reflective. It wasn't the cascading waterfalls I wanted to do, but you know, it was the right thing. Some scary uh, photos of existing conditions. Yeah, it was scary. <laughs> I had hair when I started that project. <laughs> this on the far right, that's where, that's where Gensler came up with this great idea to bring, to extend this walkway and at the end of that space to have a lift that will get you up to the area they call the shed, which is where you have that beautiful glass shed uh, lean-to up there, which now is accessible to all. And from there you can come all the way across the third level to where the steps are, so you can see the garden from all the different perspectives. Scary. <laughs> no soil. You get, oh! And I got trees that were bigger than I specified, because who knew? You know, there wasn't the tree that I wanted at the size that I wanted it. It was, it was slim pickings. So we got trees that were bigger. And instead of saying, Raymond, you did a great job. You got bigger trees for the same money. No, I was like, Raymond, these trees aren't going to fit in there. They're going to overlap. They're going to crash into each other, and it's going to look like hell. I said, have you ever been in the woods? You know, the, the trees grow together. You know, you have to do some pruning. You know, if you bring them in there and they're not fitting right, you do some pruning, selective pruning. So I spent a whole day up in the trees climbing them and pruning them because I didn't want anybody else to do it. And um, 
And I had so much fun, I did all but three trees. I went back the next day to finish the three trees, and they said, our insurance won't cover you up in those trees. So a couple of them didn't get pruned. Go see if you can figure out which ones those were. But here's the trees in the boxes. We had the right slope in each box for where each of these trees was going to be. Found out later when you take them out of the boxes and the gravel just all, it doesn't matter, but who knew? The first tree's going in. That's a net from SiteWorks. This is the tree that died. Dan had, he had a, an informal alley of flowering trees in the part of the, of the garden that he thought had the most light to be able to allow that. And he actually brought jacaranda trees. The original plan that I saw was some sort of uh, cassia or acacia. But somewhere down along the line, they ended up using uh, jacarandas. When we analyzed the trees that were on the original plans, the only plants that we saw in the atrium that were on the same list that Dan had were the camellias. And so we used those, those did well. But then there were some caliandras that were thrown in there, which is a beautiful South American, Central American tree that, that probably doesn't bloom too much inside, but has a beautiful, you know, multi-stem kind of character. I pruned those too. <laughs> I pruned those in the nursery, because they were bushes. But those ended up doing really well. They were there already. I saw a couple of them in the space and said, aha, that might be a great tree to replace a jacaranda. It has a delicate leaf. You know, it has flowering capabilities. So that's what we ended up doing for the, I think those are one of the more successful trees. Although when we first brought them in, they lost all their leaves, the first ones. Another scary moment. When the job was first done, there was a lot more light coming in this building. Look at the size of the vegetation outside and around in Tudor Park now. So, you know, once again, not enough light. That's why when you go by there a lot at nights, you'll see how bright it is. They need to run those grow, grow lights like eight hours. And now I'm just gonna show you a few before and after pictures that were taken about two months apart. And then some of my favorite uh, new photos. That's the alley I was talking about of the Caliandra. This is a level that you could never get to before, and you see the, the wheel stops along that walkway for accessibility. This level you still can't get to. And, you know, we use things like fern matrices. Like, there's these four ferns we're going to use where Dan had ferns. Let's see which one does better, you know, which one will live. That was, a, uh, that was a strategy Dan used originally for the garden as well. Now, there's one placement where they have the big column just to the east of the reflection pond that Dan had one of his trees that we, we put the tree there, and it, there's just not enough light there. So we took that tree. It died, and we're not going to put one back there because it's, it's, it's futile. But, you know, there's an order here. There's, there's, a, there's a documentation of what Dan's intentions were and it's there and it can be followed going forward in the future. And it looks just like a little bit like a wild forest. Dare might say it even looks a little bit like a jungle. <laughs> They're still throwing pennies in the damn thing. <laughs> there you see the new accessibility path. And this is a space where you can actually go there and they'll let you go in there and use their Wi-Fi and, and have a meeting or you know, spend some quiet time inside and look down into the garden. I know that my daughter was in town just recently and she said that she went there to see it and it was closed for some kind of construction. I know COVID probably did a number on it, but um, I'm sure it's, I think it's back open now to the public, which is what a great gift to the city. And that concludes my talk. Thank you very much. I'm, so, I'm such a groupie when I see Raymond present that project. Um, what, what I want to do, Raymond, is ask a couple of questions. First, I want to start sort of um, not project specific. You said kind of casually when you showed that plan of the drawing that you did of the, you know, the, the, the plan. Um, and having been to your home and to your office, I know that you still draw. And I was wondering if you could speak to that in the context of this audience about, I mean, how many people still draw to problem solve? 
How many people under 40 draw to problem solve? <laughs> Thank you. I'm just kind of curious if you could speak to uh, drawing by hand in the context of not just this project, but just generally speaking about how you approach. Well, Raj. first, I want to say that for me, drawing is a joy. I mean, and I am a dinosaur. I did take CAD, but we had to learn computer programming when I was in college, but we didn't have to learn how to draw on computers. No one did. So it was probably, I, I started hiring people who did CAD probably um, the late 1990s, you know, and then I was doing more, you know, hospitality work and things like that, and I needed people to, you know, it's very important. And I, kn I knew this architect from Peru who was a great architect. There was no business in Peru. He was used to designing uh, hospitals and museums and, you know, really great government projects. And he couldn't get any work, so he came to Miami. That guy could draw, like, unbelievably. And then one day he decided to learn CAD. And I thought, man, I lost a patriot drawer, you know, so I said to him, you know, I thought you loved the pencil. He says, yes, Raymond. He says, the computer's just a more powerful pencil. Well, I totally understand the mentality and how you use a computer. It's just that I draw for myself, basically. I don't really usually draw drawings for presentation or whatever. I do like to do everything I do well, so I make my drawings attractive to me, but it's, it's my work process. It's how, I, it's how I dialogue with myself. That's what my drawings are to me. I have so many talented people in the studio that can take my drawings and scan them, put them into any kind of shape you want to see, and our firm wouldn't be where it is without them, but they allow me to do what I like to do. I like to stand on my feet and draw, you know, and look out the window at the squirrels in my tree. <laughs> I don't know that I'd even become a landscape architect. Well, it's a different era now. Everybody uses computers, everybody's used to them, but that was never my intention. I wanted to be a landscape architect because I was trying to find a job where I could be outside as much as I possibly could and be closer to nature. Of course, I have to be inside a lot because drawings don't do very well in rain and humidity. <laughs> but um, I surround myself with windows, so I feel like I'm outside most of the time when I'm working. Um, the other question I wanted to ask you is when I showed all of these earlier projects by Kylie that are not designated, and you noticed that most of those had grids. and You've mentioned about working with SiteWorks. I know that Annette and her people are out there, I think, on a weekly basis, if I'm not mistaken. But I also know from our conversations earlier that there is a nursery where, you know, people are paying, rent is being paid for the plant materials that are inhabiting that space that are on hold for the Ford Foundation. So I guess my question for you is, is it possible to actually maintain design intent for a Kylie landscape unless you have a real plan for stewardship and a commitment from the patron because of the exactitude of the work? Well, at the Miller Garden, there's no reason why they didn't use the header there, why someone decided to get creative and put liripe there, and you're right, the textures, texture in a garden is everything. That's probably because they didn't do any research, or it was, I don't know why they would do that. But now there's no excuse at the Ford Foundation because there is a well-documented palette of the, of the canopy, the, the understory, and the ground covers for every area there. And I guess my, my last question that I wanted to ask you is, I'd never heard you say that about a waterfall on the inside, and I don't know if you were just being Raymond Jungles when you said that or if you were serious. But, um, you know, I know when I go there, and the first time that I went there, and there was no one else there, and you could hear the white noise from that water cascading over the edge and how magical that was. And I'm just, you know, I, I'm kind of curious as a, as a person who's often associated with color and exuberance and inspired by Burley Marx and, you know, real wham-pow Monticelli publications, um, what did you learn about yourself in working on this project? To tread lightly? <laughs> <laughs> No, I mean, I really did think that to go from the second level and do a very simple shoot down to the pond and have the water go underneath the pavement by the pond and into the water garden would not be that bad of a thing, you know. <laughs> I, my hands were slapped, and rightly so. 
But then when I'm up there with Joe Carr and I'm talking to him about, uh, about the whole process, he tells me Dan had a different plan one time. Dan had a lot more water cascading, he had more tropical plants, and then Roche didn't want to do any of that, so Dan was, got flustered and said, all right, Joe, you do it. That may or may not be true, but that's what Joe Carr told me. <laughs> well, I, I know that we're packed in here tonight, and I want to be really respectful of everyone's time. I, I first want to thank ABC for hosting us today and, and how fortunate we are, in particular in New York City, to have ABC's presence as such a hive of activity uh, for the built environment, in particular the landscape architecture community. So Lindsay, Jonathan, everyone, thank you so much for this evening. Thank you.